Well, hello everyone. Welcome back to Adri's Digital Basement 2. We're on a super mini mail call episode and it's mega hot here in Portland. Over, I think it's 105 degrees outside right now, which is hot. I have shut off the air conditioning, so you're not hearing that during this video, but I'm gonna to try to move quickly here so I can turn it back on so the upstairs in the house doesn't get too hot. All right, first package here is from Brett in Florida. Hi to all my Florida viewers. Let's see what we have going on in here. We got a note and some stuff. We'll skip right to the note. The note reads, hi Adrian, greetings, and I hope this letter and package find you doing well. Your content is consistently interesting and informative, and I'm always looking forward to your videos when they come out. Recently, I watched your video where you did a speed run repairing five Commodore 64 C's. I thought you might be able to make use of the item that I have sent you. Admittedly, my last package of stuff was a bit lame, <laughs> so I hope this one will make up for it. COVID, the lockdowns and restrictions during this time caused people to re react and cope in different ways. In my case, I developed an addiction and eBay was my particular drug of choice. Coupled with renewed interest in retro, add a dash of hoarding, and you can only imagine what that led to. The package contains a small sample of the results. As an aside about the aforementioned C64 repair video, the very first C64 repair I performed was on a C64 or a 64C shortboard that not only had two bad RAM chips, but the color RAM was also faulty. So it seems like you said, the Achilles heel of a 64C shortboard is the RAM. Hopefully you'll find the included parts useful with respect to that video. All the included parts were fully functional last time I checked them, but maybe wise to double check. One plus that came out of the last package I sent was when I watched the super mini mail call episode, I took your criticisms of my chip storage method and have done some upgrades. <laughs> I'm sorry, Brad, I don't remember what I said about it. I hope I wasn't too horrible. Thank you again for all you do and keep up the great content. Thank you, Brett. So let's see, what do we have here? I'm gonna move into the middle of the camera. Okay, we have a little package here, which looks like it will have some ICs in here. Ooh, very nice. Let's get the magnifying goggles on and zoom in on these. Well, oh, 6526s. <gasps> Look at this. Wow, eight of them. That's spectacular. If you watched that last video where I fixed five machines, besides the fact that a bunch were bad RAM, as Brad mentioned in the letter, a bunch of them also had bad 6526s. This is the IO chip that on the 64 is responsible for the keyboard and the joystick, along with the what disk drive and the user port on the other one. There are two of these in each machine. And unfortunately, these chips seem to go bad, not super frequently, but they do go bad. And right now it is the one chip where there isn't a good aftermarket replacement. Although I will add, people are working on it and there are definitely some that are underway that will be FPGA, I think, based replacements for these chips. So they're, they're here, they're just around the corner. The question of course is gonna be with, like with any FPGA replacement, will it be cost effective to replace the chips that are in your machine or will it be cheaper just to like buy replacements off eBay or whatever? But I haven't looked at 6526s in a while. And um, like, let's be honest, when I do those repairs of those 64s, I put a, a working 6526 in there. I don't leave that chip in there because I usually I took it out of another working machine, get it working in the machine under test, make sure that it's fully functional. And then I move that chip back into its original machine because even I don't have very many of these. So this is actually awesome because this means I'll be able to, um, well, actually fix some of these machines, like truly fix some of these machines, not just fixed in the sense of like, yeah, it works now. Um, and then I put a label that says that that's the bad part. You got to put a working one in to make it work again. But yeah, that's pretty awesome. Let's grab the ZIF 64 here. Uh, that's the 6526 and let's pop these in and I'll just quickly run through and test these. I just wanna make sure uh, that they all work and I'll put a tick mark on them when I know that they are fully functional. And just like that, I've gone ahead and I tested all of them and Brent, they're all working perfectly. The ZIF64 makes testing chips like this a cinch. Of course, I do have the test harness connected. Thank you for the viewer that sent that in along with the diagnostic cartridge here. 
and then I just quickly swap through these. And I have this nice Sharpie, finally, so I can write on stuff with a marker that's not hard to see like I normally do. So thanks again, Brett, for sending these in. These are amazing. I shouldn't close the lid quite yet because uh, the paint might be wet. But that is awesome. That is going to go to fixing a bunch of more Commodore 64s. And when I was about to put the 64 away, uh, the diagnostic was reporting that my 6526, the one that's in this machine, was not working. And I got to say that this chip, it works, but it seems to be sensitive to where I have it in the socket there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to clean the legs here. So a little bit of a uh, deoxit here on some magic eraser is my kind of go-to trick for trying to clean these. So let's see here. Yeah, it's just getting some oxidation off the legs there. Take a look at that, a little bit of uh, crap there coming off. And we'll do the backside as well. It does uh, shred the magic eraser a little bit. Okay, let's see, is that gonna fix this chip so it works? Unfortunately, I don't have the capture device connected up. I'm using my little Apple 2C monitor here. Let's see if this results in a working system. All right, I don't think you'll be able to see it, but everything is okay now. So at least for now, that little trick did the trick. That trick did the trick. <laughs> the problem is I have been having this issue on this machine occasionally and literally just moving that chip around in the socket makes it work. I thought it was the Ziff socket, but every single one of these chips that I tested from Brett worked fine. And yet when I put my chip back in there right away, I just thought I'll turn it on just for good measure. And sure enough, it said keyboard open and yada, yada, yada. And I've tried swapping the two chips that are in this machine into the different sockets, like from the Ziff into the regular one. And it seems to always be the keyboard that is the problem. So I think that Ziff socket is just flaky and maybe I need some more deoxid in the socket. Anyhow, time to move on. This is not a repair video for my Ziff 64. Alrighty, so next package here comes from Peter in Indiana. Hi to all my viewers in Indiana. Where's my knife? I have misplaced it. Here it is. Ooh, it has some really nice foam packaging. We have a letter or something on the top. What do we got inside? Ooh, really nicely packaged. With all sorts of goodies in here. I think I just accidentally switched the camera in, but by putting something on top of the mouse. Okay, that's it for what's in the box. Looks like we have some kind of a computer or something here. So let's take a look at the letter in here. Is this some candy? It looks like some candy, maybe. Ah, uh, yes, okay, I remember this. Uh, the date here, June 29th, it's been a little bit of time. Let's zoom in here. So, dear Adrian, here's the Atari 1200XL we discussed over email the other day. I bought it along with its power supply from someone at VCF West sometime in the late 90s or early 2000s. Wow, VCF West has been going on that long? I always wanted to do something with it to learn how its graphics worked since I grew up as a Commodore kid and the Atari graphics arcana were deep mysteries to me. Sadly, I never got around to doing much with the machine. When I saw your recent video on the Atari 800 and 800 XL, I thought you'd be the right person to have this little quirk of computing history. So far as I know, the machine is in working condition. It powered up only a few months ago. Not having any of the disk drives or printer peripherals, I was unable to test the serial port. I did replace the keyboard membrane because the old one was completely shot. Well, that's incredible. That is awesome. The, there's a little shop down in San Jose called Best Electronics, I think it's called, that specializes in Atari parts, and they have replacement keyboard membranes for some of the machines. Other than that, I believe the machine is original. I'm also including three cartridges, basic, logo, a language that fascinated me as a kid, and looks like an unopened copy of Dig Dug. Although at some point in the past, an elephant seems to have used it as a cushion. Thank you for the entertainment and interesting videos you've made, and I hope you find these things interesting. All the best, Peter. Peter, thank you very much. That is amazing. I remember talking to you about this computer. And yes, on a recent second channel video, I mean, maybe it's not so recent at this point, I took a look at several Atari 8-bit machines to figure out which ones worked and which didn't. And I had a brand new in-box Atari 800, well not new in-box, but an in-box 800 XL. And in there were some magazines and stuff or like, you know, brochures talking about all the different versions of Atari machines that existed. And in that, it talked about like this, I think it was like a 1400 XL or some kind of an Atari machine that was never released. And instead of that computer, the 1200XL was released, I think, 
or I may be mess mixing up my history, but the 1200XL is a very odd machine. Whoa, this is in mint condition. Whoa, look at this thing. It looks incredible. Whoa, it is, it is very, very nice. So the 1200XL was a bit of a flop. Let's go take a quick look at Wikipedia. Just to refresh my memory, because I think I'm getting the details wrong. And here's the Wikipedia article on the 8-bit series of machines from Atari. It says that the 1200XL was announced in December of 82, and then it was actually presented in January 83 at CES and started shipping in 1983, although there's no citation for that, so it may not be accurate information. It had 64K of RAM, just like the 800XL ended up having. It had built-in self-test, redesigned keyboard with four function keys and a help key, and the redesigned cable port layout. The number of joystick ports was reduced from two to four, and as far as my um, understanding is, that was done because the chip that handles the joystick ports, those extra lines that went to the extra ports, are used for the RAM banking in this machine and also all the later versions of the machines that had more than 48K of RAM. There's no PAL version of the 1200XL, and it was announced at a price of $1,000, although it was released at $899, so a little bit of a price break there, $101. This is $100 less than the announced price of the $800 of its... This was $100 less than the release price of the $800, although that was in 1979, and DRAM prices had changed quite a bit. By the time this machine came out, though, of course, the $800 was much lower and was still for sale. But this is the wild thing. The 1200XL, remember, started shipping in March of 1983. And according to this, it was discontinued by June. So it barely was on the market. There just weren't that many of these. The press warned that the price was just too much on this thing. And I mean, it doesn't really say too much else about it in this article. Although I could, I thought I remember reading that there were also some compatibility issues with this original machine as well versus the 800XL, which came out later. And it goes on to talk about that right here. The 1200XL was a flop and the machines were still too expensive to produce. So the original 800, which was still on the market with its really thick case and heavy RF shielding and whatnot on the inside, it just cost a lot to make. And compared to the Commodore 64, which by this point was on the market and the 64 and the VIC-20 and whatever were really cheap to make because they're just cheap plastic cases or whatever, they, it was really hard for Atari to compete at that point. So they really needed something to be cost competitive and that's where the 600XL and the 800XL came out. It does talk about here, I know we're not talking about the 800XL, that it was in limited supply during the Christmas season in 1983 there, which means that it really didn't compete well to the 64, at least here in North America, because the, you know that, at that point, computers were just flying off the shelves. So if you couldn't get something on the, on the shelves by Christmas, you were in trouble. Ah, right, and here it is. Okay, so the 1400XL, I think there was a 1450XL with built-in disk drives. That Those were shown in that catalog that I had in that second channel video, and they were supposed to come out alongside the 600 and 800 XL, which would have been after this 1200XL here, although those machines never actually came out. And then here's the excellent timeline that they often have on Wikipedia, and there it is, 400 and 800, that's the original machines. They were sold all the way up until here in 1983. The 1200 XL came out and was just a little blip in the road. And according to this, there's actually a gap when the 400, 800 stopped being manufactured before the 600 and the 800 went on sale. So that seems a little unusual, although maybe they weren't making them and they were just trying to sell through the old ones. Later machines like the 65XE and the 130XE, those had styling like the Atari ST machines came out. And I know the 130XT has additional RAM 128K, and I don't have one of those machines. I think it's very similar to the 800XL, except, you know, cosmetically it looks different. And then it has that extra banked memory available that is used by some specific software. Although I did purchase a RAM expansion for my 800XL. It's up there on the shelf behind me. And I think it upgrades the computer to one meg or something like that. I got it from Poland from, uh, I don't know, there's a retailer there that has all sorts of cool Atari stuff. So that will be in a future video. But anyhow, let's get back to this 1200XL. So as I said, the condition is incredible. Like the, <laughs> there is just no yellowing on this. The keyboard feels really nice to type on. It does, this machine has these F keys here, which I think is a bit weird and it's not on the other Atari machines. This key right here has a little like symbol, I think is normally 
uh, has a physical key on the regular keyboard. And then these normal keys are on the side here, at least like start and option and I think reset and stuff like that. So yeah, this thing, oh, resets right here on this thing. So yeah, this thing is, um, has some really cool styling. I, I, I really dig the way this thing looks. So looking on the sides, nothing on the right side. The left side, it does appear, and I can't really see very well. It looks like there's a cartridge slot right here. We have two angled joystick ports. Check that out. How cool is that? Angled, <laughs> I've never seen that. Uh, we have the power switch right here, and the back of the machine has the power input. Is this a channel selector? I think a channel selector for the RF, which is that. This is the video connector, the SIO port right here. And I guess this thing lacks the parallel IO port that is on the 800 and the 600. That's kind of interesting. And looking at the bottom, this thing is in excellent shape. There's a serial number in case anyone is interested in that. It is missing a foot right there, but otherwise this machine, as I said, is in freaking mint condition. Absolutely amazing. So let's take a look at this power supply. I am curious, the later 600 XL machines and the 800 XL just had a normal five volt input, although it used this like weird DIN connector. This may have, oh, nine volts AC. Okay, so this is the same type of power supply used on the disk drives, along with the original 400 and 800 XL also uses an AC input. Inside there's like a rectifier little power supply. So this thing is safe to use, it's not dangerous. I heard, I'm pretty sure people talked about the fact that the five volt power supply that is used on the 800 XL, the one that came from Atari, similar to the one with 64 is dangerous to use and you shouldn't use it. So somewhere on my desk here, I don't know where it is, um, I have a regular five volt switching power supply where I just cut the end off and then added a DIN connector onto it so then that I can use that with my 600 XL and the 800 XLs and use that safely without any risk of damage. But this thing just has a normal type kind of barrel jack right there. And that, like I said, is safe to use. And that's kind of cool. This is the same power supply that is used in these other Atari machines. So let's take a look at the cartridges that were included. So Atari logo, that's pretty cool. This is actually one I don't have. And then this one here is basic computing language, which I don't really understand the point of this unless somehow it's not built into this particular machine. I do have a couple cartridges I just have sitting off to the side right here. Uh, I have Ms. Pac-Man, this is for testing. I have another one of these basic computing languages one. This uh, CXL 4002 is absolutely needed when you're trying to use basic on the 400 and the 800 because it's not built in. If you turn the computer on without these connected, you just sort of like get a memo pad thing, which just allows you to sort of type on the console essentially. And finally we have this, which I thought was candy. <laughs> it's actually an unopened but squished copy of Dig Dug. So let's take a look at this. And there it is, and indeed it is a little squashed. Unfortunately, the shrink wrap has shrunk. So I think a lot of this crushing actually came from the shrink wrap and not from um, getting squished. So I'm gonna take it out of the shrink wrap because it's not really intact anyways. And I kind of dig this box art here. <laughs> Look at the guy with the bomb here and the underground smash arcade hit video game cartridge for the Atari 2600. Wait a second. <laughs> so this is not even for the computer. This is for the 2600. Okay, well still, that's pretty cool. Definitely feels like the cartridge is in here. Let's just take a look, open this up. So yes, in case anyone is aware, the 2600 game cartridges are not compatible with the Atari 8-bit machines like this. They don't physically fit, so you can't accidentally mix them up. But yeah, there's the game cart. Oh, look at that, it's mint, absolutely mint condition. Now I'm not a big game collector, so uh, you know, it's, I'm not always trying to chase the, the best boxed game or whatever, which is why I just opened this, but it's still pretty fun to see this. Uh, we got the 90 day warranty and the manual here for Dig Dug for the 2600. I'll break out a 2600 so we can uh, validate that this cartridge does work. But first things first, Let's grab some cables and let's test this machine out and see how well it is working. For connecting this up, we have two cable options. We have a VIC-20 cable here, so just composite video, that works. And there's also this one I made, which is the Chroma Luma output. And it says Atari 800 because the 800 has the Chroma Luma. I think this computer does as well. The 800 XL, as I talked about in a recent video, does not and requires a little bit of a mod to enable that output. 
All right, I'm hooked up to the Retro Tink Habitat for composite video uh, power switch. Okay, well, that doesn't look good. It sounded like it's working. Is this a problem with the Retro Tink? Let's turn it off and power it back on again, just to make sure, because I have had weird issues with the Tink and I'm gonna grab a monitor just to double check if we still get no picture here. Whatever reason, this retro tank always seems to default to OIP, PBR, whatever. And yes, look, see, look at that. It was a problem with the retro tank. This thing is very problematic. I probably need to uh, upgrade the firmware. I'm on 3.0. I don't know if that's the most current version or not, but I have nothing but problems with this thing. It is an issue. Okay, so cool. When you turn this on, look at this cool Atari logo you get. Which, um, which kind of implies actually that the basic is not built in and you need the basic cartridge to actually do anything. So first of all, let's try powering it on with the option key selected. One of these will do a kind of a diagnostic mode. Uh, it's not that one. No, actually, so all you have to do is push the help key when it's at that Atari logo, which seems a bit different than it is on the 800XL. So it pops up with Atari, you hit help, and there it is memory, audio, video, and keyboard. So first of all, and we do audio visual and hit start. <laughs> it's a little bit of an 8-bit dance party, the Atari style. It goes through and tests the, uh, I think, four sound channels that the Atari has here. All right, yeah, awesome. That that does seem to be working perfectly. And there is a keyboard test, which is pretty sweet. You just uh, hit that and then you can, you know, type to make sure all your keys are working. But I'm gonna believe that it does because Peter switched out the keyboard membrane on this. Thank you very much for saving me that work. Gosh, this thing looks amazing. Also, I'm noticing that the image looks pretty washed out, but I am going to, once again, I'm gonna blame that this is something to do with this. Now, everything looks okay, although I suppose it should be on 7.5 IRE. That is the normal setting for North America here. It still looks a little not great. There may be some fixes for the video quality on the 1200XL, so if anyone is aware of the mods you can do to the motherboard to improve the video output, definitely let me know, because yeah, it's looking a little not great. Now, remember, I'm not using the S-Video output, so it could look better still should look a little less washed out than this. Let's do the memory test here and I'll let this run through the test and then we'll try out these cartridges. Well, I just noticed something on the computer here, there's an L1 light and an L2 light. And as it's running through the RAM test here, these are changing. What do these lights do exactly? Is this indicate the RAM banking or, or something? I've never seen these on any other Atari. Now, while this is running as well, I noticed there's a little bit of a, Oh, okay, I thought there was some kind of a mark inside this uh, clear plastic here, but using this microfiber cloth seems to take it off. Okay, actually, no, there's a bit of, it's a bit of scuffing in the actual clear plastic. So I could use some of that plastic polish to probably get that off. But this computer, as I said, it is absolutely in mint condition. So whoever owned this thing originally when they bought it, must not have used it very much. Maybe they um, put it back into its box or something. I don't know, because it's like, wow. Peter, I am really grateful for this. This thing feels like an absolute treasure. And um, I'm really, really, I don't know. I'm really kind of amazed looking at this here on the bench here, because it's just, it looks so, so darn cool. The RAM test is still going on. I just wanted to kind of show the L1 and the L2 lights there changing as the RAM test runs through. It's kind of, kind of interesting there. And we are done with the RAM test and all is working. Now I'm not surprised because the computer probably wouldn't work very reliably if it wasn't for that. But uh, yeah, let's hit the reset button. I do have a gamepad plugged in here, my modified Nintendo Entertainment one. There's not a lot of room on the side here where you plug the joystick in. So if you have a large connector, it's probably not gonna fit. Now this one has no trouble because it's actually, I think I took it off an Atari flashback controller, something like that. So this fits in without any issue there. Let's power off the computer and first we'll try the basic language cartridge here. Whoa, that goes deep into the computer. Notice it's not sticking out at all while the cartridge is stuck in there. 
and speaker. Okay, there we go. We got basic running. So 10 print. This is Atari basic. Uh Oh, the two key doesn't appear to work very well. Yeah, if you push it on the lower part of the key, you get nothing. It's all the way down right now. If you push it over on the right side or left side, it's fine. But on the lower edge, it doesn't work very reliably. So even though it's a new membrane, <laughs> it's not great. All right, let's see how this is working. There it is. This is Atari Basic. There's a break key. Hey, that actually that broke, broke out of there. All right, so you can reach in and grab the cartridge out. It's a little bit of a trick. There it is. So that just sticks way in there. Let's try logo. My logo skills are very rudimentary. I, of course, I learned logo when I was in school. All right, welcome to Atari logo. Um, PD, that does pen down. So that is the turtle. And this is designed for like as a rudimentary programming language to draw lines and stuff like that. And if I remember you put FW 20, oh, of course the two key again, not working very well. No, 20, oh, there it is. FD for forward. And then you can do like right turn and you type the number of degrees. So you say a 90 degree turn. So the little turtle, which on the Apple II is a little like arrow, switch to 90 degree, you do forward again, put another 30 in, hit enter. You can do, I think, PU for pen up, which now if you do forward, it won't draw a line. See, it moved the turtle without drawing. And then you go PD for pen down, and then you can do, you know, forward again. 30 and then you can do left turn 95 and then you can do FD 50 and see how it drew at an angle there because I did 95 degrees. So yeah, that's logo and it supports subroutines and stuff. So you can actually do repeating shapes and because it's angled based, you can like turn a little bit, draw, turn, draw, and then end up drawing a circle for instance, not just squares or lines. So that's logo. And um, yeah, I think as a, as a, a starter language for children and stuff, that was quite good. I learned how to write, I don't know, I did some cool pictures and stuff like that. Let's try a game because that's what we all want to see working, right? This is Miss Pac-Man here. Ooh, it loads very quickly. So we hit start. Sounds good. Um, hello? Hello? What's, what's going on? Okay. Okay, I obviously have it plugged into the wrong port. Let's try this one. Ha, ah, there we go. It's quite a good version of Pac-Man compared to the Atari 2600, for instance. <laughs> and we got some sprite flicker there. Anyhow, okay, so yeah, this machine is uh, is working great. I mean, I think the only problem we've encountered is that the two key doesn't work very reliably. If we pop in basic or logo or whatever, I should probably type the rest of the letters and just see which ones don't work. Actually, to be honest, I don't need that. I can just use the built-in diagnostics. So we just turn this on and we can hit the help key which will take us into the diagnostics once we get that nice, beautiful Atari logo there. So let's see here. Yep, two is definitely problematic. Five as well is not working very well at all. I think the tab key doesn't work at all. Oh yeah, it really doesn't work properly. Okay, anyway, so tab, not well. So indeed, it feels like the, well, tab key barely works. Two is very problematic. And then five is also not working very well. So if anyone watching has tips 
on how to potentially improve the keyboard on this thing, uh, let me know. Considering it has a new membrane, is this just a matter of still some dirty contacts or something like that? I remember how it was on my 800, the original 800, that thing had a membrane. I had to peel it off and I think I repositioned it slightly and then it was working a lot better, but it certainly wasn't working very well. It wasn't working at all actually before I did that. So I'm definitely looking for tips and tricks on the 1200 XL about how to improve the keyboard because definitely is let down by the fact that those two keys, look at this, two and five, just almost nothing happening there. So Peter, thanks again though for sending in this machine. It is absolutely a jewel. It's mint, so the only problem obviously appears to be the membrane still giving us some problems. I can imagine though, before you switched out the membrane, the keyboard probably didn't work at all. So thank you very much for doing that. And yes, I'm just looking for tips on how to improve that little thing. But what a jewel, what an amazing machine. Thank you so much for sending this in. And I guess that's gonna be it for the video, to be honest. So Brett, thanks for sending in those 6526s. We had a little bit of Commodore 64 and we had a little bit of Atari 8-bit on this video. Two rival machines. How many people fought with their friends about which computer was better back in the day? I can only imagine there was a ton of fighting. <laughs> so yeah. Anyways, that's gonna be it for this video. Thanks very much for watching. If you enjoyed it, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. Huge thanks to everyone who sent stuff into the mail call this episode and everything in the past before. There's still a bunch of stuff I haven't gotten to that I need to show on video, to be honest. I'm trying to catch up, but unfortunately, I started to accumulate another big pile of stuff. So uh, it's kind of what goes on because I just get sidetracked working on other stuff and then people are so generous and they donate things, so it builds up again. So there we have it. Anyways, if you liked it, thumbs up. If you didn't, you know what to do. Huge thanks to my patrons. They literally make all of this possible at this point. So um, their support means so much to me. If you want to become a supporter, there's a link in the description below. Um, I recently did a live stream for my uh, higher level tiers, my four bit nibble, whatever tier and up. They get extra stuff behind the scenes, things like that. And I did a live stream, my very first live stream for them. So that was just the other day. And you can go watch it on there um, if you want to watch a playback. Although unfortunately the live chat got live lost because I edited the video in the YouTube editor and like little did I know if you edit a live stream it removes the comments or you know the live the chat the live chat that's going on so that that totally sucks um, but anyhow it was really really fun it was about two hours long and um, we just sort of talked about random stuff people asked questions and I just talk 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 as I do so well <laughs> And thanks for bearing with me. I'm still getting over uh, human malware here over COVID. And um, so I have a little bit of uh, congestion and residual symptoms and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, anyhow, that's it. Thanks very much for watching. Stay healthy, stay safe. I'll see you next time. Bye.